Hi, my name is Kevin and I collect old irons. There is a distinctive category of irons that uses many of the various technologies we talked about in past videos, but which are especially adapted for those who travel. Traveling businessmen in the late 1800s, early 1900s were quite common. This was also a time when a traveling business person would gain respect and credibility according to how they dressed. You should look spiffy, which is to say that your outfit should have creases and, and, and no obvious wrinkles. And that's pretty hard to do when everything that you bring with you is in a suitcase. This is a travel iron set from the 1880s. It is, and we've seen a little bit of this before, a Dean's slug iron. Let's see, I can take the top off. I can have put the fluting iron plate and roller on top. It even has a nice little stand. It has everything that a traveling salesman could want. Wait, these are just ordinary irons. There's no special adaptation to this. Let me show you the box. Now, this is not all that convenient when you think about it though. This weighs about 20 pounds. I'm going to have this in one hand and all the rest of my baggage in the other hand. Not very convenient. And I have to tell you that these sets are quite rare. So an early travel iron set, but not with the gadgetry we're going to see in some of the ones coming up. The gas jet irons were already well established in the 1870s through 1890s. Uh, we've seen this Wilkinson 1871 patent before, and here are some of the gas jets that developed in the 1890s as well. These, of course, used a gas line in your motel room, but they fell a little bit out of fashion as the 1890s progressed, and gas lines were no longer included in the motel rooms everything had gone to electricity. We've seen these in the thus far, but let me show you something new. This is a McDonald's rotary hat iron. And first of all, I want to show you the box. It's a very well-made box, and that's quite distinctive of many of the travel irons. They come in very good containers, very compact, with the idea that you will actually use the containers to enclose your irons and consequently the irons and the boxes are often found together. Uh, this particular iron is again McDonald rotary turns here um, gas jet it would be warmed on your gas line and you would use it to iron your hats both outside and inside. And let's talk about why the need for such a compact device. Let's remind ourselves that besides everything else that you're bringing with you, you're also bringing your hat. And here's the container for that. And by the way, uh, this particular container you might notice has a DC-3 on the front. Uh, these fancy hats were used well into the 1900s. One of the iron entrepreneurs that we've met before was Nelson R. Streeter. And this is the Streeter Sensible Model 45, which is advertised here as a tourist iron. 
we would call it a travel iron now. Rick Tyler, who provided me with these photographs, tells me that this iron came out in about 1910, and that's a little late in the storyline that I'm presenting here. But Streeter had produced sensible irons of all kinds of sizes, and I think some of these small sizes had been used as travel irons, and, and Streeter was smart enough to recognize this and market to that niche. But there were a variety of other smaller irons in the 1890s. These two are both patented in 1895. This by James Banwell, who had a, a Mrs. Potts kind of iron, but it has these, these two pins on the bottom. Quite a unique system. And this is the Reuben Myers iron with a very interesting attachment mechanism here. These two irons are oftentimes referred to as salesman samples or as toys, but I don't think these were either. They weren't salesman samples. Salesman samples were something that a salesman would carry door to door with a small piece in advertising and selling a larger item, and these did not occur in larger sizes. And I don't think these are toys either. Both of these irons are extremely well made. Both of them have patent dates. And toys did not need to be well made or have patent dates. And besides that, and we'll just take a look at the Myers here, um, why would a child desire this iron? This iron is nothing like the iron that mom would be using. Mom would probably be using a Mrs. Potts iron. These are travel irons. I do not have any contemporary advertisements to back up that speculation, but I don't think these were advertised directly to the buyer. Rather, these were sold in the men's shops, in the haberdashery. A man would come in, be getting together some clothing for a business trip, and, well, look at this. This is just the kind of small, ruggedly built item that I could use to keep that clothing crisp. Enter the Europeans. The Germans, the English, other countries as well, each came up with a variety of interesting travel iron designs. I'll show a couple of representatives here. Each representative is for a group of various companies and various countries making their own particular versions. This one has a nice box. You'll notice there's nice, lots of uh, padding in here to keep everything in place as you travel with it. And there is a flat iron. Let me take that out and I'll take the rest of these things out as well. I can assemble the flat iron. I can screw this down. I have a stand. And I have a small alcohol stove. Put alcohol in here and light it. And that can heat it up. I even have a little funnel here to help pour the alcohol into the stove. And this is German, probably from the 1890s. Um, does not have the original handle. And it probably originally came in a leather box. I'll open it up. And... Here's my flat iron. And what I have here is I have a stand and I have a stove. I'm going to go ahead and I'll take this off. We have a little wick. We can pour alcohol in here, set up the wick, light that, put that on top here, and there we are. There was also a very wide variety of irons in the early 1900s that used Metafuel. Um, Metafuel looks like a little matchbox. It is a manufactured burnable fuel, solid safe fuel made in Switzerland uh, with British, US, India, Canada, and Australia patent numbers here. Uh, there were other equivalent fuels. This is a German equivalent. And let's take a look at a couple of these irons. These very often, again, are available in the original boxes. And let's take this one out and take a look at it. 
Let's see now. This is a stand. I put the Metafuel right here so that would fit right there and I could burn it. And here's the iron on top of it. And I also have this is a curling iron for women's hair. And we'll put that aside. Uh, this particular one has a newspaper clipping in here from 1931. And this is a, another one. This is called a boudoir iron. Many different kinds, uh, different descriptions, and different colors. Again, the, the same kind of device, and you'd be buying the stand separately. And while I'm at it, showing that there are many varieties, this is one that I bought in the recent auction. Uh, Metafuel would fit inside here, and this rotates so that I have two faces to use in the ironing process. There are many variations on this group. A few words to the collector. Many iron collectors don't get too deep into the travel irons and I'm an example of that. And perhaps because of that lack of interest, the irons are very inexpensive. I've already mentioned after the auction that I bought this iron for ten dollars and individually these irons don't cost very much. But what you should be doing is looking for the sets. The, the boxes and so forth. And let's just take a look at a few more of these. This is another German iron. This iron is called a spirit iron. We've seen some of these irons previously. They come in all kinds of sizes. This is obviously a travel iron set. And let's just say a little more about this. Um, here's the iron. Here's the tank and the insides. Here's where you'd have your fuel, which would be alcohol. And to light this, you would put some alcohol here on this, light that, put this on here, and that would heat this up, get the vapor flowing. Once you got this working, you can then put that into here. So, again, German, this particular one does not have the decorations on the back, does not have any of the paperwork with it. I'd love to have that. But then again, I found this earlier in our collecting as is for $60, a good price, and I've yet to find a better one. So, a German spirit iron. And now let's look at some American internally heated liquid fuel irons. This is a very common alcohol burning iron from circa 1901 to 1910 or so called the Imperial. And it has everything you need. Uh, this is a little alcohol bottle for pouring into the tank here. I also have a much larger container for additional alcohol. Um, this has some of the original paperwork here has some of the also the parts and brushes and, and everything else in here as well. So very nice set and again all wrapped up and if I can get this tightened in I can pick it up by the handle. And let me show you another one. This is a diamond. Uh, this is from uh, the Imperials from you know, first decade of the 1900s. This would probably be from about the 1930s. And inside I want to show you that we have the, the pump. We have lots of paperwork associated with it. And here is the iron itself. Very pretty iron. And I hope in a later video that we might try to fire this thing up and see what we can do with it. And let's take a look at a American electric travel iron. This is a rather large affair. I have a sunbeam here. I have a similar getup in a hot point here in its original box, so I'm not going to open that. But let me show you. It's got a nice metal housing here. Front goes down very much like the Imperial does. And within, I have my iron and my cord. 
So, nice little get up with a with a handle. But I, I have to say that this box is fairly large and fairly heavy. We're going to find in the next video that there was an awful lot of interesting ideas towards making the electric irons in the 1930s to 1960s or so far more compact. So, with all this said, uh, please subscribe, send any comments to me, and we look forward to seeing you again.